Hello, it's Katie Forrestal, and I am happy to say that we are on the last part of Chapter 1 in our study of 10 reasons, common sense reasons, to reject pornography. And for those of you who have been watching or reading from my blog, either way, thank you for staying with us. And um, I noticed on the last one, number part four, that there wasn't a lot of viewers, so I'm hoping maybe you're reading, but if you're not, maybe you're just taking your time, and that's okay, because there's a lot of information here, but I thank you for paying attention to what you have so far, and keep going, because there's a, so much more information ahead. So, for those of you who are starting with this one right here, um, this is all about a book that is partially finished called 10 Common Sense Reasons to Reject Pornography. All of the writing that I'm reading from is on rejectpornography.com. All references are there also. So I will mention when there's a quote, but I won't give you the reference. You can go look that up yourself if you need to. So we're going to go right ahead because we only want to make these about 10 minutes and finish off this chapter. So we finished up talking about the narcissistic activists and all that psychobabble, <laughs> for those of you who aren't used to that, although the nar narcissistic movement is a big thing right now, and I don't want to, I don't want to make that too, like, um, too much of a issue, because a lot of people go around finger pointing and calling people narcissists when they don't know how to deal with certain things that the people are trying to tell them, but clearly, in this situation, there was narcissism going on here, whether they knew it or not. So we're going to go on and talk about the power of deception. The first thing that I'm going to read is a quote from one of my favorite movies, Inception. What is the most resilient parasite? A bacteria? A virus? An intestinal worm? An idea. Resilient. Highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. An idea that is fully formed, fully understood, that sticks right in there somewhere. End quote. The power of the parasite is distributed through many hosts and synergy binds, blinds the entire movement and demands all the host's attention and energy. The followers are brainwashed into a believing a lie, and the infectious tide of the masses become hard to swim against. Pornography is an epidemic that has infected many and continues to grow at a rapid pace across the spectrum of social status, age, and ethnicity. Irvin Howe argued in Notes on a Mass Culture in 1948 that mass culture was an agency of vast psychological control, perpetuating passivity and shredding personality, its only aims being to provide relief from work monotony without making the return to work too unbearable. It must provide amusement without insight, pleasure without disturbance. Ironically, an example of this became evident in another predatory marketing practice that devastated many people in America, the subprime mortgage crisis. While the watchdogs for American corporations were busy at play, the foxes got away. I have a few quotes here. First quote. A report obtained by ABC News says senior employees of the SEC spent hours on the commission's computers looking at sites like Naughty.com, Spankwire, YouPorn, and others. This report found 31 serious offenders were senior officers with salaries ranging from $100,000 to $222,000 per year. Some of the offenses included one senior attorney spending up to eight hours a day watching porn, two SEC accountants attempting to access porn sites, one 1,800 times in a two-week period, the other 16,000 times in a month, and other employees bypassing and deliberately disabling filters. End quote. Another quote, Representative Daryl Issa of California, ranking Republican on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, said it was nothing short of disturbing that high-ranking officials within the SEC were spending more time looking at pornography than taking action to help stave off the events that brought our nation's economy to the brink of collapse. This stunning report should make everyone question the wisdom of moving forward with plans to give regulators like the SEC even more widespread authority. End quote. 
All right, so let's talk about government intervention in pornography and what's been done so far and where we're going with it. We talked about uh, balancing law with um, freedom and the right to free speech and all those things. And chapter two will have a lot of information about legal things in it, so stay tuned for that. But here's a quote about government intervention. The government is intended to be a watchdog for the corporation. However, too much government stifles business and enforcement of laws is not always easily administered. Another quote, law is forced to locate a victim and also prove the victim has suffered harm before the state can intervene, yet it, it is impossible to take account the harm of pollution. The public atmosphere that is at stake, not just an individual made ill by the air, that we all have no choice but to breathe, end quote. Although big government is not the answer, there are times when intervention is necessary to move the pendulum back in the right direction. The government has stepped in on more than one occasion. President Nixon took a stand during his term of office. Quote, Nixon went on the offensive soon after taking office, pressuring Congress to enact legislation that would stem the flow of offensive sex materials, prodding Attorney General John Mitchell to seek strong measures to curb pornography and urging Postmaster General Winton Blount to put the smut merchants out of business. Nixon stated that so long as I am in the White House, there will be no relaxation of the effort to control and eliminate smut from our national life, end quote. The Reagan administration also acted by appointing a committee to do new research. Here is a statement from three of the appointed members of the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography. Quote, we are three women who have in varied ways devoted our lives to the welfare of children and families. One as a specialist in the treatment of those who sexually abuse women and children. Another as a journalist covering the diverse issues facing contemporary American women, and the third as a specialist in the prevention and treatment of child abuse, neglect, and molestation. We share a deep concern about the effects of pornography on American women. We wish to express our strong personal objections to the offensive and totally inaccurate materials that portray women as eager victims of abuse or as being of less competence or value, or value to society than men. We disapprove equally of media depictions that discriminate unfairly against men or against specific races, cultures, or those with physical or mental disabilities. We abhor the exploitation of vulnerable people and condemn those, condemn those who profit from it. End quote. It wasn't until the Clinton administration that pornographers saw an open door to spread the plague of pornography to an almost uncontrollable fire. Quote, the trade publication of the porn industry, Adult Video News, frequently praised the Clinton Justice Department for not enforcing federal obscenity laws. The March 2000 issue asked, how likely is it, would you say, that we are going to enjoy the same benevolent neglect that the industry has enjoyed under Janet Reno? Regardless of who is elected, our fortunes are going to change, end quote. Larry Flint and his followers saw the Clinton administration as a brief open window that it was important to go through with a carpe diem attitude. Mark Croner, Ivy League graduate and director of the Hustler series, Jail Babes, which played on the idea that porn consumers would love the mixture of illegal behavior and illicit sex, made this statement, quote, The Clinton administration opened up an era of blue skies, green lights, and fat bank accounts for the pornography industry, end quote. During Obama's reign as president, he signed the H.R. 159, which classified any child under 18 who was subjected to sex trafficking a victim, and the H.R. 285, which classifies that punishment also extends to those who advertise children for sex. But he failed to continue the fight against pornography. Quote, as great as these bills are, however, they fail to properly address the most important part of sex trafficking, reducing demand before men use, abuse, and torture women, girls, and boys for sadistic personal pleasure. And according to one of the nation's leading academics studying the effect of pornography, a self-described radical feminist, pornography is the key ingredient to that demand. End quote. In J July 2016, Donald Trump signed a pledge drafted by activist group Enough is Enough. In signing 
this is a quote, in signing, the group says Trump promised to steer more resources toward prosecutions and to appoint an attorney general who would make enforcement of federal obscenity laws, along with the laws against child abuse and child pornography, a top priority, end quote. It specifically addresses obscenity laws and possible societal harms, and it mainly focuses on child exploitation. President and CEO of the group, Donna Rice Hughes, is hopeful for change. Ms. Hughes understands the problem with pornography and business ethics and sees Donald Trump as a strong opponent. Quote, the pornographers have been laughing their way to the bank for years, Hughes says. They're huge and it's getting worse. What you need is someone who's strong and is going to put their foot down. So that... Oh, no, not quite. One more paragraph and we'll be done with chapter one. I will continue to clarify the government's role in obscenity in the latter part of chapter two as we explore how pornography promotes prostitution and objectification. Theories that endorse the legalization of prostitution, sex as a commodity, or sex as a viable career choice have not been prominent in American government or in American business ethics. The FCC was founded to protect children and a large segment of the population from becoming contaminated with theories that are attached to agendas promoted by a small segment of society. The First Amendment has an obscenity clause that has been vigorously debated but does require that community standards are adhered to. Although the lines for community standards are blurry, all legislation has paid special attention to protecting children. So that is the end of chapter one. And as I said, in chapter two, we will not only go on to a lot of legal issues, but we will also go into other cultures and how they have handled uh, prostitution and sex work and how America is different. And I will show you some reasons that you can think about yourself that we don't want to go to the places that they've gone. There's a lot of generational curses that have been put on the girls that um, they think it's just normal and they have to do it. And we don't want to ever get to that place. So I'm going to end this now and I'll be back with you on chapter two next time. Thanks for listening.